at that time, and that time is 1963 when he was here, he told us uh, that there were quite some living in Europe. And um, he said there were 15 living in the Scandinavian area. And uh, some stayed for a longer time, some stayed for shorter times. They came and they went and so on and so forth. Now, in the later years, we have found out that uh, they are rather active in the Swedish area. And uh, two days ago, I had a lecture in a society in, inside the United Nations called SEAT. And uh, a week before I left, the space people working in Sweden uh, sent me a elementary message to give to the United Nations and to the world leaders via one of the contactees in Sweden. So they are around, they are active, but in many, many cases people don't know that they are there because, as I said before, they look just like we do. They fit into our society, they even work in our society. They are interested in and concerned in our development as a race, as a society, and the type of behaviors that we display, what we are doing to our planet, the destruction of the only place we have right now, We're not unlike they, they can go to different places. Uh, they're very concerned with that, and they bring a message of peace and understanding, purpose of life. It has nothing to do with fear, it has nothing to do with manipulation of the mind, nor the taking over of the world and this planet. I can assure you they have societies and much better places to live. They certainly wouldn't need this place. They've been coming amongst us for thousands of years, and we as a civilization are not very receptive to peaceful ideas. Uh, we tend to be very aggressive, whether we burn people at the stakes, or whether we discredit them for their ideas, uh, or blatantly shoot and execute people. Uh, I would be very hesitant, I would be very cautious coming to this world, because we're not very stable. And so they have decided to walk amongst us more in a Peace Corps type of situation, and then help individuals or individual bodies with the type of information they bring. On April the 23rd, 1965, George Adamski passed away after a heart attack. He was buried in the Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C., close to the grave of President John F. Kennedy. But in the hearts of his friends and followers, he is unforgotten to this day. They are convinced he was not just an ordinary person, but a man with a mission. The last thing he showed me <laughs> before he left, and that was the last time I saw him, he pulled up his thing and showed me his navel. He didn't have one. He had a starburst incised in his belly, the depth of my finger, cut into the flesh, deep, deep, deep channels. I said, how the hell did you get that? He said, I don't know, I was born with it, I've always had it. I said, well, who are you, George? He said, well, I don't know, but you see, I cannot remember anything before I was four years old, when my parents, who were Polish immigrants, came to America, and they told me, while they were waiting on the docks for the ship, with a little boy for George Adamski, a mysterious man just came up and took him away, a few minutes later brought him back again, but he was a different child. George was a, uh, a person who was always receptive to this type of thought and the type of message that they brought. He already spoke of it in the 30s. Um, he had uh, a number of sightings already before the uh, telescopic shots that he took in the late 40s. and. Uh, why not, George? You can say that of anyone. Why him and not the next one? And then why not the next one and not him? It was him. And, um, and I'm sure that they, they uh, examined him by, by looking at his, his thinking and his reactions and if he would be a good person to bring this forward. 
he was genuine. <laughs> you could feel truth and, and genuine friendship. He was friendly and he was not he, he was not an actor of any kind of any you know, he just wasn't. He was sincere and honest and you could feel the honesty and and, and the warmth from him. And he was he was uh, enthusiastic and very happy at that about this film because this would help to, to silence some of the 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 critics. And he was very happy about the film and uh and he he definitely uh, has, and he had a sense of humor. He definitely had a sense of humor. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to withstood all the that barrage of questions from some people for hours and hours on end. And sometimes it got a little argumentative too. But he definitely said, "No, no, none of this." He said, "I'm telling you the facts, and I'm sharing them with you." And he says, "It's up to you to believe it or not." But he said. It is important that the people of Earth know that these people are here and they've been coming for hundreds and thousands of years and but now because we're about to go into space that's what they told him and also that we're having difficulty with atmosphere here on Earth because of pollution that would continually get worse and remember this was 1965 and it has occurred too we have many problems as you all know with with uh, thick thick and thicker pollution george adamski was not the only contactee shortly after he went public others followed and claimed that they had similar experiences some of them were charlatans and cultists who spread messages of salvation and tried to deceive the gullible with cheap fake films or discredited the true contactees But others had genuine experiences. The American rocket technician Daniel Fry claimed he 